In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. That gospel we've just heard makes for very uncomfortable listening. The background is that last Sunday's gospel recorded a pivotal point in the ministry of Jesus when Peter confessed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then today's gospel began with the words, from that time Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and endure great suffering. It's not difficult to understand how Jesus came to this conclusion. At the heart of his ministry was the proclamation that the kingdom of God, the rule of God in human affairs was here. And he knew that if this was going to have any effect, he had to take it to the political and religious establishment in Jerusalem. And he knew also, he felt it in his bones, that if he did that, it would arouse conflict and he was likely to have be rejected and to suffer. Peter, who was always very emotional when he heard about this suffering, responded, it shan't happen to you, Lord, it shan't happen to you. And Jesus replies, what well, seems quite a lot of vehemence, get behind me, Satan, you're thinking as God, as man thinks, not as God thinks. And I find in that response a very kind of authentic note. It's as though Jesus is revealing something of the tussle within himself. Because as a human being, he wanted to live a full life. He didn't want to die, but he knew that he was going to be faithful to God's commission to him. This would probably inevitably lead to suffering, to rejection, and uh, to death. But he knew that he had to go on with it. Now that emphasis upon the inevitability of Jesus having to suffer in his ministry is followed by a statement which is even more uncomfortable and challenging. Anyone who wishes to be a follower of mine must renounce self. He must take up his cross and follow me. And this for millions of people in history has literally meant putting their lives on the line. For nearly the first 300 years of the church's existence, Christianity was illegal and the church was subject to spasmodic, spasmodic but very, very fierce persecution. And so it is today in scores and scores of countries around the world, Christians are a harassed and persecuted minority. The Christian faith is the most persecuted faith in the world today by a long way. Now today's passage, as well as being a challenge to the seriousness of those who regard ourselves as disciples of Jesus, offers some very, very fundamental issues of belief. Because the Jesus of the Gospel is the one who asks of us total, unconditional loyalty. That's a very big ask. Total, unconditional loyalty. Follow me he said. Now if someone today said that, and sometimes political or religious figures do, we would be right to be highly suspicious, wouldn't we? We don't want poorer figures around. Why should we respond to the call of Jesus for this total, unconditional loyalty? What makes him different? Now I think we need to approach this very big question against a background of our whole understanding of what it is for God be God. First of all, God is not a thing in the world of things, not one item amongst others. God is the underlying first cause of all secondary causes. He is the underlying first cause of all secondary causes, or to put it in less philosophical terms, which we do in this Eucharist, all things come from you, and of your own we give you. All things, every atom, every electron, every cell, every complex multicellular structures like ourselves depends moment by moment for its existence on the unimaginable ground and source and fount of all being. And secondly, this God from whom all good things come wills 
wants to fill us with himself, with his own life. He gives each one of us a life of our own, our own life, our very own life, to make our own decisions, to choose our own way in life. At the same time, he invites us to open our hearts and minds to God, that he might fill us with his own light and life and love. And that indeed is our vocation as human beings. This is why we are here, to grow into that likeness and to be filled with the life of God, which is nothing less than the love of God. Now, if this is what God is like and what God wants, the question that arises as to how he can share his own life with us. And the Christian claim is that he has chosen to do this in terms we can understand, in human terms. And it is against this background that the call of Jesus to follow him has to be understood. He is not a human despot. He came to us in total humility and powerlessness, in total disposition. And in this he incarnates the unconditional gift of God's own life to us and the unconditional claim of God upon us. Now this is not only a challenge to our discipleship, but because we are human, we experience as a, as a threat to our autonomy. For we like to be self-sufficient, in charge of our own life, going our own way, beholden to no one. And if Jesus manifests in human terms both the absolute gift of God to us, but also the absolute claim of God upon us, because to believe in God is to believe in one who by definition makes a total difference of the way we see and try to live us, then this comes inevitably to us as something of a threat. But it also had before us, we also had before us, the testimony of those who have tried this, who have tried to respond to the invitation of Christ in however feeble a way, who tell us time and again that this is the way which leads to fulfilment and happiness. One of the most remarkable, outstanding Secretary Generals of the United Nations over the 20th century was the Swedish diplomat Doug Hammarskjöld, who was in a plane which was shot down over the Congo in 1961 when he was going out to try to solve some political crisis. The day came, he was at the heart of the world's political crisis, working sometimes 20 hours a day, but when he got home at night, he used to keep a spiritual notebook and put jottings in it. One entry is like any other of a very other human being, he finds himself confused about what life is all about. In 1952, for example, he wrote, What I ask is absurd, that life shall have a meaning. meaning. But a later entry, for Whit Sunday, 1961, in fact, not long before he was killed, we find this in the notebook. Once I answered yes to someone or something, and from that hour, I was certain that existence is meaningful and that therefore my life in self-surrender has a goal. He said yes to someone or something and from that moment he knew that life was meaningful and that his life of self-giving for the world's peace had a point. Now a testimony close to home appeared in last Sunday's reflections in our parish notes on the lockout dumped down by a member of our own congregation, Kathy Puss. She wrote in the parish notes, I was also reminded of the powerful impression I had when being surgically treated for cancer two years ago, that those gifts of mine, my body and God's shepherding hand, in these I had everything that I needed. Our mission is at heart a very simple one. Follow me, Christ tells us. There's a great sense of relief and freedom to be able to do that and to cast aside our usual daily anxieties. The invitation to follow Christ in daily self-surrender and the discipleship of love does indeed come for most of us much of the time as a threat 
and a challenge to our autonomy. But as she put it, our mission is at heart a very simple one. Follow me, Christ told us. There's a great sense of relief and freedom to be able to do that and to cast aside our usual daily anxieties. Now one of the themes running through T.S. Eliot's great poem, Four Quartets, is how the past and the future all point to one reality, which is always present, what he sometimes calls the timeless moment, or the still point of the turning world. Everything leads up to this, and this point we find our joy and our fulfilment. And the end of the poem, we have these arresting lines. Quick now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. It does indeed cost not less than everything, for it is the absolute claim of God for a total, unconditional loyalty. But it is at the same time something that is totally simple, an opening up, a handing over, a being available for the work of love. And it is now, here, now, always, every moment. In here is our fulfilment, here is our delight, here is our happiness in whatever future, in future we have before us in this life and whatever one might lie beyond us. Anyone who wishes to be a follower of me must renounce self, he must take up his cross and follow me. Quick now, here, now, always, a complete condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And quite simply, it means trying to live as fully as we can in the present, trying to do what the spiritual writers have always called practicing the presence of, presence of God, seeking to open our hearts and minds to the leading of love, the leading of Christ himself, incarnate love, the incarnate and our gift of love for us. And to that God who gives us all his gifts, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be all glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.